Stay hungry, stay foolish. As always, thank you to our sponsor, Zai. Zai is a global fintech innovating in their area of expertise, building integrated financial services for digital native and non native businesses. Check them out at hellozai.com. Welcome back to part three with Ben Bensau built to innovate essential practices to wire into innovation into your company's DNA. Don't forget, we have a copy up for grabs. Just join the innovation show.io newsletter, you may think we're going to cover all the content in the book, we will be miles away, there is so much content in it. But today, we're going to focus on a few case studies. In particular, we're going to look into Samsung and how they use Triz, a methodology to mine the databases and understand the future. We're going to look at eco eco sem a cement factory that have innovated magnificently. We're going to look at Cordsa and we're going to intertwine many of Ben's methodologies as well in there. Ben, welcome back to the show. Hello, good morning, Aidan. I'm very excited to be here again. Let's get into it, Ben. So I thought we'd open up with with Samsung. And one of the keys to Samsung's emergence as an electronics innovator was the company's adoption across the board of Triz. I'd love you to unpack this, Ben. Samsung is 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 an interesting company uh, from my point of view for 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 multiple reasons. Um, um, I mean, it is in a sense a story that I uh, uncovered about uh, Samsung is very similar to what uh, we talked about already at uh, BSF, for instance, and some of the other examples in in, in the book of a, a, a company that uh, might not have thought of itself as being innovative it, to, to start with. I mean, uh, just like, you know, uh, coming after the Japanese wave of, uh, of, of innovators, Samsung for a long time was seen as a company that uh, uh, was, was, was kind of, a, um, let's say, leveraging innovations from other places and becoming and being a very fast follower than rather than in an innovator if you will and 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 very similarly uh, uh, to to BASF they systematically created i mean what i refer to as an innovating engine to actually uh, boost and leverage the innovating capabilities across the organization and 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 became People had uh, quite a bit of doubts in the beginning that Samsung would be an innovative company, and I don't think there's any doubts about it anymore. So one of the uh, first initiatives they've done was to actually uh, uh, em embrace Triz, which is a, a methodology which was developed from all places in the Soviet Union. Uh, I think this was kind of used uh, in the development of the Sputnik. So this is a very engineering-based uh, analytical, systematic approach to find conflicts in in the design of 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 of, of a product, a physical product. But the, the the interesting thing here, the interesting analogy to all the companies in the book is that they massively trained people in this methodology. So this was uh, uh, something that people would get uh, trained in. Uh, um, they would have projects, and and they were able to actually close quite of the gap on innovation just with this. But then they 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 stayed with it. They kept on, you know, again emphasizing the notion of training people, uh, having a process for innovating, and then they encountered another methodology. I mentioned, by the way, in the book very often that I'm not I'm I'm not kind of dogmatic about methodology. There are many different methodologies that are extremely useful to help people think outside the box. So, for engineering type of uh, uh, innovations, Triz was very powerful, and it, it kind of uh, jump started a little bit the uh, the innovating engine at, uh, at at Samsung. But the next step for them was when they discovered about Blue Ocean Strategy. Uh, which actually happened to be developed by a colleague of mine called Chang Kim. I'm sure people are familiar with that. He definitely uh, was involved in, in, in helping uh, Samsung uh, learn and internalize uh, uh, Blue, Ocean, Blue Ocean Strategy. Actually, it was even before Blue Ocean Strategy was called Blue Ocean Strategy. Before that, it was called Value Innovation from uh, uh, 1998. And what Samsung did is that they created what they call a VIP center. This is Value Innovation Project Center. This is a, 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 a I think it's a seven-story building in 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 the suburbs of Seoul where they have uh, 
uh, trained coaches, uh, coaches who are trained, of course, in trees, in all sorts of uh, um, innovation methodologies, including blue ocean strategy, and then teams of, of, of people from different business units would, would, would visit the, 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 the center, be trained and coached, and they would not leave the center until they, they came out with some new ideas. So this is very similar, in a sense, conceptually to what we've seen, or what I describe in the book about the initiatives, let's say, at, at, at Bayer, at uh, BASF, at Courtsta, uh, uh, trying to train uh, a mass of people in a very systematic way in systematic methodologies. And that is the, the, the way that you kind of jumpstart the innovating engine. So uh, after TRIZ, Samsung embraced Blue Ocean Strategy um, and uh, again, uh, built built a capability embedded in uh, uh, everybody. So people from marketing, from different uh, departments would be going through uh, this training and would be working at the VIP center. And again, what is really interesting, um, similar to BSF and others, these initiatives to jumpstart the, uh, uh, the innovating engine have a life of their own. In the case of perspective, for instance, if you remember at BASF in 2017, they discovered that they could close it and that the, the, the innovating kind of capability was now uh, uh, embedded in the organization. So now everyone uh, uh, at BASF, uh, new hire for a professional job, gets trained in some of the key tools and key concepts that were created by, uh, by the Perspectives um, Initiative at BSF. Similarly, now a lot of people at Samsung go through this training and now the, 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 the engine has to go to the next level. And of course, you can see that what is also interesting about trees and Blue Ocean Strategy within the, the Samsung or let's say uh, an Asian kind of cultural context, it, it, it fits very well with the... Um, the the, the 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 propensity to believe in processes and in 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 training people and following some sort of a structured process and what maybe you see uh, uh more um, less often in 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 asian cultures is the um the spontaneous kind of genius type of 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 innovative spirit and this is something that samsung is recognizing uh, and and um, in parallel to having you know this training in trees and in blue ocean and this uh, structured methodology, they are trying to bring diversity. So they're creating, they're taking their engine to another level where they're starting to uh, develop uh, labs and research centers uh, in in foreign countries. They're starting to uh, bring in uh, uh, foreigners into the company. So you can see what I'm trying to say is that this, you know, this conversation I'm having about the innovation engine and how to build it, well, there are many ways to start, number one. Uh, and there's, there's, uh, there's, there's not one fits all uh, approach. And secondly, these innovation uh, engines have a, a life of themselves. They evolve, they change over time as the context and the capability builds up in the company. So you might start with a very formalized uh, uh, initiative like perspective of the VIP center or the trees training. And then after a while, you realize that uh, some of the capability now is embedded, is part of the culture, that the, the language is there, that the, some of the norms of behavior are in, embedded in the corporation. And then you may need to uh, uh, change your the, 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 the way that you, uh, you, you kind of implement your innovating engine and move to a different phase. So there's no one kind of uh, uh, model and format, but, uh, but, but the, the notion is always the same, is to give permission to people to innovate, to train them and to create a space for them to actually uh, bring new ideas to the company. I love the way, Ben, you say you're, you're model ag agnostic, because oftentimes you have some people within organizations arguing over which, which company, which consultant, etc. And when I'm asked about this, and I'm sure you've experienced this, I kind of start with, it actually doesn't matter as long as people 
will mass adopt it? And then that raises a question, and this is where I want to get to. If you think about, Ben, how when you're usually consulted as a consultant or a team of consultants, you go into an organization and there's an expectation that you're going to bring in a methodology or a framework. And then when you re your response is, well, we got to start with the people and we got to start with the hearts and minds of people. It often takes some leaders by surprise. And it reminds me of that old adage where the CFO and the CEO are sitting in a boardroom table and the CEO goes, we need to train everybody. And the CFO turns around and goes, what if we train them all and they leave? And the CEO responds, what if we don't train them and they stay? <laughs> and that's actually oh, this the is, this is brilliant. Yeah. And, and that but that's the problem, isn't it? That that th th there's, it's almost like, it's easier for me as a leadership team to capitalize the cost of bringing in a new technology or a new IT infrastructure. But the cost of training people seems like an invisible cost. And in many ways it is. But it's the sustained training, the sustained attention, the, the spotlight shone on these initiatives, that that's the real magic. And then the technology or the methodology comes afterwards. Yes, and I think that it's even more so for innovation because I, I, as, as much as I believe that uh, uh, anybody in a company has some creative potential, uh, uh, just like when you ask people to do an execution task, I mean, they have to learn how to do it. You, you cannot improvise. I mean, we know we have a few geniuses in the company, but you know, most people need to be uh, maybe kind of given a few tools, a little bit of a, an introduction uh, about how to innovate. And and you're totally right. I'm 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 not dogmatic at all about uh, the, the the which methodology you use. As a matter of fact, I almost feel the opposite is that you, you, you there's a diminishing return to any kind of methodology you use because at some point. When you use a certain methodology, it be, it, it it becomes a blinder. I mean, you 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 you're missing the the dead. The, I mean, in French we say l'angle mort, the dead angle in the car. Lovely. You know, when you look in the mirror, there's a there's a blind spot. Blind spot in English you say the blind spot. Every methodology has a blind spot. Uh, but what is important, what is good about a methodology is that every methodology has an implicit theory has an implicit view of the world. And this is this mindset that is important. Whether you use design thinking or you use uh, uh, traditional marketing research or you use uh, blue ocean strategy, they have some sort of a mindset implicit in it. And that is what people need to have. To have so I would, I would, I would, I would, I would not kind of you know uh, take any methodology away. I would think about mostly about what is the implicit theory that it is providing and it, it, does it do the does it do, does it do the work does it get people to think from the customer for instance so does it uh, help people think outside of the box and if it does then the real mechanics of it is not really the issue and as i said uh, uh, learning a trick and overdoing it uh, has its own kind of diminishing return so i would say sometimes it's good to learn a new methodology because it it will take care maybe of one of the blind spots you might have the other very important thing about the methodology is that it becomes a language. Uh, every methodology or tool uh, has has a set of, uh, I mean, actual tools, uh, uh, and 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 that becomes the language that come, becomes a shared language where people can talk to each other. And you just mentioned the tool, and people know immediately what you're talking about. They they are already have internalized the mindset. They understand which. Because for me, the tools, the way I describe it uh, often is that a, a tool, it, it, it reminds me of the, what, um, what pilots do before the taking of the plane is that they go through a checklist. So for me, that's what a tool is. It's, it's just a checklist, a checklist of which questions to ask and in which order. And 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 that structures the mind. That helps structure the mind. So uh, uh, I think what you have to watch for is what is the implicit theory or the mindset behind the, the methodology. Is it fitting the task? What you're trying to do. If it does, then you know 
try to mix and match and 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 uh, you, you you might get people to see something different using different methodologies uh, and as you say uh, uh, it it develops people uh, it's you, you adding a new you know some people very love to have certification in these different tools so I think it's 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 a way to show that you're you're taking uh, them seriously. You you investing in their creativity and giving them the tools. And the more you give them, uh, the, 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 the 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 more the more they feel they have permission, and the more they will reward you with 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 great ideas. There's a really interesting thing you said there about Samsung. Before we move on, and we're going to cover the Pentagon as well in a second, which is a great case study. But I, I wanted to just highlight something there, you, you mentioned the diversity, the embracing of diversity by Samsung. And this is something that uh, on this show, we, we cover shows on empathy on, you know, uh, diversity of thought of you know, neurodiversity, etc. And it's for that very reason that when you embrace that, the magic happens, because as the great adage goes in innovation, inter innovation happens at the intersections of different people of different minds of different departments of you with your customer as you've proven in your book. But there's one really important thing here, I think. And this is a very human aspect, but one that needs to change, which is the leadership team, you, because you mentioned the common language. And sometimes the leadership team or the managers, the middle managers of an organization, like to have their own language, because it makes them feel somewhat superior in the old hierarchy of things. And there's a letting go of that mindset that has to happen at that leadership level, because you want people across your organization using the tools using the common language, because that's where the real magic comes from. But it's very, very difficult for many, many senior leaders to let go of that and kind of go, you, you know, it's kind of like, if you were, um, you know, uh, in the most basic role in the organization, and you came up to the CEO, and you mentioned some tra technology, hey, I, I was checking out Triz the other day, and it's like, on, what do you know about Triz? Triz is for me and my team. <laughs> yeah. There's a little bit of that still there, a thread of that. And that that's where humility becomes a new smart. You have to have that hum humility and actually speak the same language. So, when I was talking about the the three processes, uh, clearly um, uh, a big contribution that senior people have to make is really to to I mean in the in the, in the reframing process is to I mean give permission to put innovation at the center to create the infrastructure, and we we we'll, we'll certainly will talk more about the. The, the, the structural infrastructure they have to build, but one one of the things that they have to create is 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 indeed this this language, this common. So if we have a common goal, we have a common mission, and we try to share the same mindset, we should be able to talk about it and have a common language. And 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 that's what I was saying. I don't really. I mean, I, I don't think it's very important which language you use, as long as it, it 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 fits with the mindset and the purpose. Whether this is this methodology or that methodology, what is important is that uh, 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 people have some elements of language that they share and 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 they sh and they share the same meaning, of course. And w one thing uh, that is actually a, a common pattern in in many of the companies that I've featured in the book. Uh, as you might have mentioned, uh, quite a few of them I actually worked with them, uh, and 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 the process has has been very similar, and this is something that now I do with most of the organizations I, uh, I work with is to say, well, if you want to build the innovating engine, if you want to go through this uh, transformation of culture to become more of an innovative culture, then the first people who have to hear the story are the senior people. And I used to have a lot of resistance to that. People say, well, we, 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 don't, need, we don't need to be, be trained. We, we're already convinced and all that. But I realized that it's very important that uh, they are, even if it's a half day, even if it's, but, but they need to uh, 
understand what are the principles uh, uh, and and you know the, the 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 mental model behind a methodology what it does what is it for and they need to understand some of the logic of the methodology and even some of the specific tools without them having to use them i mean i got sometimes some some board members to use some of the tools and 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 go visit customers but 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 that's 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 not necessarily what i i would always expect but at least the fact that they they have some of the 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 language and the key vocabulary and the the kind of the grammar of the methodology then i tell them then we, then we need to go to the middle managers and then when we train the middle managers for them to know that the senior managers understand the language understand the methodology is very important not only in terms of motivating them but when they when they have to have a conversation or present or justify something it makes it so much more powerful and convincing for them to use to use some some tool and very often i mean the 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 we might talk about chapter 10 at some point but uh, some of the tools that are, uh, I, I, I like are very often very simple very simple tools very visual and very intuitive so we're not talking about you know trees trees is quite elaborate is quite sophisticated but some of the tools that we use to just uh, help people uh, listen to the customer um, uh, present their ideas uh, 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 around the value test that we talked about the japanese manager who asked only you know two questions what's the value to the customer what's the value to us this can be very easily displayed in a tool uh, which we called value curve uh, uh, so for the senior leaders to be aware of those tools to be able to be fluent and converse in that language not only validates the the, the middle managers but also the frontline people and it, it it creates a strong validation and credibility in whatever uh, tool or, or or training people take. If 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 the senior leaders were not even engaged or didn't even know about it, uh, I think it would create a disconnect and 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 turn into 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 cynicism. Uh, I, I had actually one one person once uh, ex- explained to me that. Uh, as 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 soon as as soon as um, the, the the leaders don't get engaged in some of these initiatives, people think it's a training program. They don't think it's a transformation program anymore. So it's very important that the senior leaders not only speak the language, show their face. Uh, I often insist once we once the, the senior level people have been trained, you know. In the foundations, you know, it, as I said, it can be a half day. Then you train the middle managers, and then you get the the, the most kind of frontline people work on real life projects. So this is much more elaborate. But the fact that the CEO shows up, or that they can make presentation to the CEO, and the CEO can ask some questions, but uh, not vague questions where he or doesn't or she doesn't seem to know what, what what this is about but 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 there's a there's a there's a, there's there's very pertinent questions related to the methodology uh that creates um a sense of meaning for people you know it, they, they they lose their cynicism and they get really uh, excited about uh, I- engaging and showing to the ceo that they, they they understand the tool and they understand what they're doing so i think yes I, I agree. Even a simple act of the email about the the meeting or the training coming from the CEO has a massive impact. Like I, I one thing I always ask: can can this come from the CEO? Can the email come from it? And maybe a little bit, just a sentence of it. I found the training great myself because well, I don't know about you, Ben, but what I find is oftentimes if you start with a department in the organization, they'll say something like oh, the leadership team need to have this training, or can my manager get this training? And you're kind of, and if you can answer, they already have, that's a great win, but uh, oftentimes it's not the case. Aidan, I could tell you lots of very uh, uh, crispy stories I had where, so I would, I would like sometimes spend a day with the, um, with, with the executive committee or the board, and, and, and I purposefully always get them to do a little exercise. 
Um, and, and it's a very simple exercise people can do with a tool or without a tool, but I usually use a tool. And I, it's a very simple question. It's the, the first question that Mr. Iwashita is thinking, you know, what value are we creating for the customer? So I actually get the board or the executive committee to make a list of what they think the company is adding value to the customer. And I keep it. And then I have the, the, the next layer people do the same exercise. And of course, with the permission of the, of, the, of the senior people, I show that to people. You know, this is what you came up with. Let me show you what your executive committee came up with. And that's very powerful. I mean, just to kind of, I mean, and, and you can see it works in any way, in either way. If, if, if there are commonalities, people re feel really proud that they actually have the same kind of thinking as, 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 um, as the executive committee. They feel that they are creating, uh, they agree on what value the company is creating for their customers. And if there are, uh, uh, you know, some discrepancies, then it's a very interesting conversation. Uh, um, and, and, and very often it is, it is interesting that the, Frontline people uh, identify items that are not in the list of the senior people. And that's very powerful as well, because the, the frontline people say, well, these guys are too disconnected from the reality. Let, 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 let me tell you, Ben, you know. Yeah. So, so, so I think it's, uh, and, and, and this is something very important. If, 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 if senior leaders are really uh, serious and sincere about this, uh, I, I, I think they should engage and participate and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, without going through a, a full kind of, you know, uh, uh, complex training, have a sense of what the methodology is about, uh, what are we talking about, and, and be able to have a conversation with their people, to challenge their people, uh, and 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 cover a little bit what 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 they would what would they come up with? So I think it's uh, it's um, there's nothing wrong uh, for senior leaders to be in a conversation where they try to learn from the front line uh, when they talk about the customers, rather than have you know some. The, the, the interesting thing about the methodology is that it structures the thinking. It's like it's not kind of a, a vague conceptual question. It's like you know. What would you put in this list? What you don't put in this list, and then and then and then it's it's it anchors the conversation. It's not just kind of yeah. Let's uh, let's uh, create a new business model. Let's let's create value for our customers. So no no no. What do you think it is? It 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 it, it brings things to a specific level, which I think is very important. Eric, you reminded me there of a brilliant Peter Drucker quote, which is the customer is rarely buying what the company thinks it's selling. <laughs> and there's always this disconnect, particularly over time, uh, what the company selling changes for the customer. But let, let's get into big government because big government is an area that is not associated with innovation, let's put it that way. And Ben, I was delighted to read about this case study because many of our listeners work in governmental agencies, many of them work in government, some of them work in the military. And oftentimes, the the mindset is very closed towards innovation. And there's almost the self talk, if you want to call it that about working in an organization like that is, oh, things around here will never change. Oh, you know what it's like around here. And that that actually is a huge blocker as well to, to opening up the lines towards innovation. But I wanted to start with a quote here, because this line will ring true for so many of our listeners. You say some of the reasons for this problem are unique to government, including the vast bureaucracy saddled with ultra complex procurement rules intended to safeguard taxpayers money. But the biggest challenge is often the sheer complexity of the challenge. You offer the example here of the Pentagon, developing the kinds of equipment troops need to survive and win battles in the world's most inhospitable places. I thought this is a great case study. So Ben, over to you. Yes, I'm, I'm. I'm. I'm glad you highlight. You want to highlight uh, the 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 Pentagon's uh, case study. I, I, I tried to, uh, on on purpose, uh, uh, to show that what I'm talking about applies to uh, uh, business, of course, and 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 I I, I tried to show examples of B two B, B two C in industries that we talked about, which are not necessarily 
necessarily known for uh, you know innovation like the tech or the entertainment industry. So as we just discussed, we we have examples in in paint, in in cement, in 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 tire. But I also wanted to show that this also applies, and the tools and the methodology and thinking applies to non-governmental. Uh, governments, government agencies, but also non-governmental agencies and non-profits. So, I mean, I have the example from 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 the Pentagon. I have an example from from YMCA, from a, from a charity uh, organization called Charity Water, to show that uh, uh, every type of organization uh, has the same challenge of uh, execution, but at the same time. Uh, uh, innovating and 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 what can we learn from those? So the the story of the Pentagon is 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 is, is an interesting one, and I like it because people can relate to the to the, the to to, to, the, to the the challenge of 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 the designers, if you will. So the, 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 of course, the Pentagon very hierarchical. Uh, 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 their customers, uh, I mean, if we can call them, are the, the, the soldiers in the field and they, 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 they have to help them, uh, you know, uh, do their job, protect them. And they have lots of uh, uh, scientists and researchers uh, uh, developing products uh, for them. And we always talk about start with the customer and be in the life of the customer. <laughs> <laughs> Try to understand the job to be done by a customer. Uh, so, how close can you be to actually be in the in in the battlefield with your with with, with your customer soldiers? So, this is where the Pentagon had this uh, very interesting initiative called uh, Operation Tech Warrior. So, this is I think is the uh, is the the uh, is, is is the Air Force I think that has a lab where. Uh, uh, in I think it's White White University. I think it's where the lab is, and it, this is a, a lab where they can simulate all sorts of hazardous and dangerous uh, war games. Um, so what they created is this uh, operation by which they can bring teams of engineers and scientists from their suppliers. They bring them together. They uh, give them uh, uh, the, the appropriate training for two weeks, um, and then they 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 make them join a squadron, and they actually go in the field with the soldiers in in kind of almost a real life situation with live ammunition, and they can actually test the products that they're developing for the Pentagon as they are being used uh, in the field. So I think this is a, a very interesting example of how we talked a bit about it before. How do you close the gap between the innovators and the customer? Because the challenge in the end is that innovation starts with the customer and it is important to understand uh, uh, what the customer is trying to do. And 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 how can you uh, uh, develop uh, products that create value for the customer? And if you don't understand their context, if you don't understand the job they're trying to do, uh, it's uh, it's 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 very difficult to to innovate for them. So these, we, we're talking about uh, uh, systems that they develop. Like for instance, um, I was being told that they have these uh, jackets where they can have like. Uh, uh, in desert situation where they can have like uh, humidification or or or, or, or um, ventilation incorporated into the, into the jacket kind of uh, type of technology, how to uh, uh, be able to 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 follow people, uh, uh, give them uh, vision in in tunnels, or to be able to communicate when they are in buildings and tunnels. So these are, we're talking about software and hardware. Uh, uh, that this, uh, you know, supplies develop. So I think, uh, again, uh, I mean, uh, this is kind of trying to show that uh, uh, government agencies uh, uh, can innovate and, uh, and in their own way uh, embrace the same kind of approach uh, uh, of being close to the customer all the way to the point of 
you know, providing people with uh, military training to be able to go in the field to test uh, how their products uh, operate or don't operate uh, as they develop uh, solutions for the for the for the Pentagon. I have an expert that I illust- that I used to illustrate this, Ben. I pulled it from the book. You say there here that Operation Tech Warrior illustrates one key difference between a company's execution engine and its innovating engine. When your people are working for the execution engine, they generally take a supplier side view of their work. They focus on solving problems that arise when manufacturing products, designing services and delivering goods to customers. They examine the marketplace and the challenge posed by competitors from their own perspective as suppliers. By contrast, when your people switch to working for the innovating engine, they need to take a customer side view of their work. They must try to look at potential products and services the way customers might see them as ways to solve customers' problems, satisfy customer desires, and excite customer imaginations. They must also broaden their perspective to include current non-customers. I thought that last line, the non-customers, is extremely essential. The other stuff makes sense in theory, (laughs) and and we're going to unpack how difficult that actually is in practice when we come to ecosem. But I just thought I'd highlight that because this non customer point is extremely important. Yes, it's very important. By the way, just to come back on the uh, the, 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 the previous comment, I mean, it's, it's very, it's, it's uh, uh, very important. And you can see that uh, they're linking it to the conversation about the uh, the methodologies, you can see a common point between a lot of methodologies, I mean, blue ocean strategy, design thinking, even uh, some aspects of, uh, of, of marketing research is really to try to uh, understand the customer or, you know, uh, uh, the life of the customer, the problem that the customer is facing, uh, and to observe the customer in their own context. I mean, I think the common point across all of these recent methodologies on innovation is really focused on the customer and 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 go beyond simply asking the customer or interviewing the customer is actually to put yourself in the in 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 the shoes in the I, I say you have to put yourself in the in, in the shoes in the mind and even in the heart of your customer to be able to detect you know we talked about this before you know the the weak signals this is a whole notion of listen to the voice of the customer you know, which requires a bit more empathy than usual. Listen to the silence of the customer. I think we talked about that. And then the third one really is is about the non-customer. And I think this is this is something also uh, uh, a, a bit different from uh, uh, the, the the focus that people have had before, which is uh, let's try to understand the, the customer we're serving or the customer that we're targeting, but. As a matter of fact, if you're trying to create value, you remember the definition of innovating is to create value um, for a customer and the organization. But the customer could be, you know, your customer if you're in B2B, but it could be your customer's customer, or it could be creating value for your supplier. So in fact, if you if you think about what you do, and again, I was talking about tools, uh, very simple. I mean, I guess it's a tool, it's a checklist, you know, uh, anything that is a checklist for me is that it qualifies as a tool. So I get people to just simply take their product or their service and to make the list of all the type of people who interact or connect to their product. So it could be your supplier, it could be your 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 your, your customer, your customer's customer. It could be a regulator, it could be uh, uh, an influencer, it could be a prescriber. Uh, so just doing that network of all the the connections that um, linked to your product give you a space where you can explore for ideas because every time you create value. So if you're in construction business, or actually I I, I worked with a, a paint company. I mean, it's mentioned in the book, Axel Nobel. So paint, uh, you, you know, B2C, there's a B2C component to it, which is basically you go in a store and you try to buy paint. But 
but sometimes people, when they choose paint, they ask uh, advice from uh, an architect or uh, from the, the, the painter uh, who, who's going to come and paint the, 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 the kid's room. Uh, there might be influencers. Uh, so it's interesting. Uh, a lot of people focus on their direct customer. But what if you, 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 you created value or you created an innovation that um, creates value for the architect or for the painter? who is going to uh, uh, promote your paint uh, because it's uh, easier to work with. So this is, this is the notion here behind the non-customer. So make a list of all the, 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 the people or types of people, customers. You know, these are customers for me because these are people you, you, you may want to make happy. So that touch your product or in contact with your product. But you can also make the list of the processes that are connected to your product. And that starts to give you a very rich uh, ecosystem, if you wish, that you can start to explore one by one, almost in a systematic manner. Um, so Ecosem is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an interesting story in, in, in the sense that, uh, we, again, uh, for me, it's, uh, it adds quite a few things to the book. I said I wanted to make sure that we have not only the usual suspects of innovation, the, the, the tech companies and the entertainment companies and you know, the, 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 the glorified companies, but also some of the less talked about companies. So cement. Boring, Ben, boring. <laughs> but, it's, but it's not actually. And, and what I love, I just wanted to highlight this for our audience is many times when we cover those big, you know, international legacy organizations that are great case studies in innovation, it's hard to relate to them. And what I love about the case studies you've picked here is they're relatable, and everybody can see it from their perspective. And Ecosem is a great example of this. Yes, absolutely. And this is this is an interesting story, because you, you, you're dealing with cement, cement industry, which I think people can, can, can get, get, get an image of what it is. But they also would understand that this is a, um, how would I say, uh, a very competitive industry with a few huge players, uh, somewhat of an oligopoly, who don't necessarily want to change the status quo. I mean, they compete uh, uh, in their markets, uh, and there's some sort of an equilibrium where there's a, there's a sense of what's the market share in different markets, but uh, it's very difficult to 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 kind of you know, bring bring any major innovation in this in this market, especially if it attacks. You know, as we would say, if if you start to attack the castle, you know. So so, Ecosem Donald Ryan, very <laughs> Irish name. I mean, the company is 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 created by him. Uh, is an Irish, uh, and I think the company is maybe Irish company. Uh, is is I I met them in France because they're based in they have a big market in France in the construction business. But but basically, Ecosem came up with a, 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 a new technology for cement. So the traditional technology, the, the, the most dominant one is called Portland cement. And, and uh, uh, Ecosem uh, uh, developed this new technology, it's called GGBS, ground granulated uh, 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 blast furnace uh, slag. GGBS. Now, what is interesting about GGBS, it's a new technology that has a much lower uh, carbon footprint than Portland cement. That's one advantage. The second advantage of GGBS cement is that it is a byproduct of the steel industry, which actually also adds a, a huge uh, uh, feature to being a very environmentally friendly technology. Uh, less carbon footprint, and it, it, it allows to recycle a pro byproduct from the steel industry. And of course, when they try to enter the market, 
uh, that that kind of was not received well by by the competitors, which would require investments in retooling. Even though everybody, by the way, everybody is paying lip service to the uh, environmental, uh, uh, you know, uh, drive and 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 making efforts to to help you know reduce footprint and 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 all that. But but when it comes to Change the change the product or change you know uh, make changes to the factories change the technology is something that uh, of course the the big players uh, kind of resisted. And we do that ourselves, Ben. I always think that we do that ourselves. Like, oh, fair trade is important to me that the farmer gets fairly paid, and then you're going to go, but you got to pay a little bit more. And really, very few of us put our money where our mouth is on on that. And uh, there's a quote here just on that because I, I found that really important. You say rather than search for new formulas and processes that might disrupt their successful businesses, cement industry leaders have delayed responding to the climate change problem. They've generally assumed that someday, they will have to invest billions in a long term solution such as carbon capture and storage, which is likely to be imposed on the industry as a whole by government action. So it's rather it's imposed upon them rather than them being proactive about it. And then another thing you say here is it's tough to convince customers to buy a new unfamiliar product. And that's a key point, even one that promises to solve a problem that customers themselves are well aware of. When the big incumbent businesses that dominate the industry all poo poo your new offering, therein lies the challenge. That's exactly the the, the crux of the story. And this is why focusing on non-customers can help. So you can see this is a situation where the dominant players uh, don't welcome this new technology. Um, So, and like you say, like you read, uh, they're kind of waiting until they get the government pressure and they can't get away with it anymore. Then they, they might, they might make some investments to, 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 to change things, but in the meantime, uh, they, they, they don't want necessarily this this technology to, to to grow and take market share from them. So they they have a tendency to, um, like you know, uh, the CEO told us, you know, they they poo poo his products <laughs> with the customers, but basically they, they they basically criticize the the product. They don't support it uh, when they deal with the big construction companies and uh, the big developers. Um, and, and of course, the customers uh, they, they listen to their big, uh, big, 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 big uh, suppliers, and uh, it's been uh, you know tough, 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 tough sell for him to go to the customers. And then he realized there was almost no way he could he could convince the customers. So what he he started to understand is that uh, maybe working with the regulators uh, could help. Uh, and he discovered, for instance, that the regulators were not necessarily well aware of this new technology. Uh, so he spent again. I mean, I think it took him almost four years, painstakingly, you know, to educate the regulators uh, to to kind of show them that this is a, a technology, and of course, this is technology that will create value for the regulators because they're really trying to. Uh, make sure that the industry becomes more uh, sustainable and more friendly to the to the environment, and 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 so he he spent a lot of time educating the regulators, uh, convincing the regulators to bring in experts in their committees and the commissions to decide on regulation, and after a, a, a long investment in that and and focusing you know. On the non-customer, that's what I mean by non-customer. These are not people they're trying to sell products to, but these are people who are going to open up the market for them. And then at some point, they managed to get uh, some uh, committees, uh, regulator, regulatory committees in France to actually recognize GGBS technology as a high uh, quality substitute for Portland uh, cement and that basically opened the valve, uh, and and then they started to have uh, uh, customers come and inquire about their solution, and and of course once they they're here and it's accepted by the regulators, that opens the the market, and then I mean people can read they they went even beyond. Uh, the typical, uh, you know, uh, uh, markets, and they start to help ports to, you know, uh, uh, get land from the water, and 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 they develop new applications for cement that did not exist before. Uh, 
key, the key for me here is this notion that uh, many people, when they think about innovation and the customer, I'm still saying that innovation starts with the customer, but in the definition of the customer, it's usually your traditional buyer. But if you open your mind, your imagination to think that the customer can be, as I said before, internal or external, I mean, it could be your internal people as well. You can innovate in HR. But even outside, if you think about uh, other people than your traditional uh, customer, uh, is very important. Either not necessarily selling to them, they're not selling cement to the, to, 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 to the regulators. We understand that, right? So another uh, kind of less dramatic example for me is like when, uh, when, when fist cars, uh, people know the, the Finnish company in uh, uh, cutting tools and tableware. Uh, when they when they when they try to understand and innovate their cutting tools, for instance, uh, um, uh, for, for 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 tableware, for instance, uh, uh, of course they talk to people who are using their products in in in, in the kitchen, but they also go and uh, engage with surgeons. Uh, because also they have to do a cutting job. They're not customers of them, but they're learning from non-customers. Uh, or when they're trying to uh, develop some uh, new axes or tools for, 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 guard, for gardening, of course they spend time to listen with empathy to the, you know, the weekend gardeners and people who take care of their flowers uh, at home. But they also go look at professional people uh, like um, forestry you know, uh, uh, workers or people who work with tractors. So they look at people who, who do the same job but as, at, at a large scale, uh, at, 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 at a much uh, higher frequency. And these are non-customers, but they learn a lot. So the non-customers, they can either become potential customers or they can teach you something that you customers cannot tell you. So they're, they're a source of inspiration at any rate. It's back to that neurodiversity as well. They see the same thing from a different perspective, and that's so important. We, we probably have time for one more. We again, over ambitious, Ben. <laughs> my, my apologies for going there in rabbit holes, uh, but I'm, I'm terrible at it. So from cement to paint, and for many, the expression, it's as boring as watching paint dry will not apply to this company because you highlight throughout the book a growing willingness of businesses to collaborate closely with other companies on innovating projects. In some cases, you say the innovating partners are customers like customers with whom Gore collaborates in its innovation center, or like we saw earlier on with Adidas and BASF. In other cases, you say companies develop an innovating ecosystem by partnering with outside startups or suppliers to develop new ways of creating value for customers and for themselves. One successful program of this kind is Paint for the Future. It's an initiative created by the Dutch based firm Axo Nobel that you mentioned previously. This is another great one, a different take on innovation, but as valuable as any other. Yes, this is a, 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 again one of those companies featured in the, in the in the book where I've worked with them for 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 for, for, for many years. So they've, they've 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 done very similar things to what we were talking about uh, with the other companies in terms of uh, uh, giving permission, training people, having a, a central unit that looks at innovation processes. Actually, the lady running that was one of the. The, the, the first people I, 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 I trained, I remember, but she's now responsible at uh, looking at innovation processes uh, outside and kind of taking uh, uh, different methodologies, approaches to innovation, developing their own version of it, and then, and then, and then, and then making it available to different units in the company. Uh, uh, and, and then they uh, started to go even beyond uh, uh, and, and say, well, innovation can, 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 can happen internally, of course, can happen with us uh, uh, engaging with the customer, but there are a lot of potential uh, in the startup world uh, uh, and, 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 and why not start to, to work to work with, with these people? So this is how Paint for the Future kind of started, where now they have this process by which they, uh, they, 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 they not only create these challenges where, uh, you know, uh, startup companies can get involved, but once they have selected uh, some candidates, some startups who apply to these uh, challenges, 
And this is where the reframing is about, right? I mean, once you frame, you know what kind of companies you want to engage with. So they actually opening the door to innovation to, we said to their customers for sure, and we saw what they did with uh, with 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 Mercedes Benz and uh, and uh, the business model uh, innovation uh, initiative, but now they even go into startups. And then, once the startups have been selected, then they 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 really take care of them. They they provide them with teams of uh, Axel Nobel uh, specialists in accounting, in 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 development, in all sorts of uh, uh, resources that they need, and they basically they basically kind of uh, nurture them like. Uh, uh, a, a small company that they're supporting. It, it, it is not, the objective is not necessarily to develop it until a point where they acquire it. I mean, there's, there's, there's this notion of, of uh, large companies going out there and uh, nurturing an ecosystem of startups with kind of the, 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 the intention at one point to internalize uh, the successful ones here, paying the future might actually uh, internalize some of the promising startups, but it, it might want to also have them there succeed on their own uh, footing uh, and, and become a supplier uh, to to Exxon Nobel. So, but this is a uh, this is I've seen this also uh, being done at. Um, uh, another company we, we talked about, Corsa, where uh, some companies now are more and more uh, opening the doors and 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 working uh, with startups, and it's not an easy thing to do because the cultures are very different. Uh, so they need to really protect um, the the startup. Uh, they need to protect the people who work with the startup. Uh, so this is this is what uh, Paint for the Future is about. And a bit more detail in the book, of course. You share the example of a company you've worked with for a very long time, Kordza. It's part of the Sambanshi Group, a giant Turkish industrial conglomerate. I'll set you up with a quote here, Ben. The innovation challenge faced by Kordza was one of many companies. In the words of Mehmet Pakarun, I hope I'm saying his name right, that the, the, then the company CEO, we were operating a mature business in an, un in an industry where the basic nature of the product fabrics used primarily in automobile tires had scarcely changed for decades. For this reason, many people in their organization wondered, why should they bother with innovation? And that is such a key question. Because we see this time and time again in innovation, we're doing well, why would we innovate? You're taking us away from milk in the cash cow, you're distracting our people, why should we do it? But that quote was absolutely so important because it was the lens through which he changed in a company dramatically. This is a, 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 another very interesting example, and it's 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 very typical of uh, many of the examples. But uh, again, what is interesting is the the fact that they did it in the industry we're talking about here. Kortsa is a, is a Turkish company, and they make fabric. Uh, that is used to reinforce tires. And what I saw is that in a, in a few years, uh, uh, starting with Mehmet Pekarum and then uh, 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 his successor, Cenk Alpert, whom I also trained uh, uh, a number of years ago, he transformed the company from being a, a commodity supplier to the tire industry, one of them competing on 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 on, on price into um, a strategic a strategic supplier uh, providing uh, uh, innovative solutions and services uh, to its traditional customers in the tire industry, but at the same time they entered completely new markets. They entered uh, uh, the market uh, in, in construction, in electronics, and even aerospace. Now, they have uh, reinforcing material they provide to, to NASA, for instance. And it is an interesting story about, again, the reframing we talked about. So it was a supplier of a commodity product. Then as he was building the innovating engine, Jenk Alper changed the, uh, the mission of the company. He called it the reinforcer. 
So he called it a reinforcer, which means that the company is about reinforcing, reinforcing anything that needs to be reinforced, not only tires. So we can reinforce construction. We can even reinforce electronic cables. We can reinforce. So you can see how the reframing opens the purpose of the organization, gives permission for people to look for new ideas in new territories. And just to close, what is fascinating, I talked to him a, a, a couple of weeks ago, and he explained to me that now his, uh, his new reframing, he called it reinforce life, which means that now Quartza is about reinforcing life, including society and sustainability and the environment. And now you can see how he's opening up for the innovating capability of the company to work on all of these enlarged topics. Now Quartza is one of the most innovative companies. It's, uh, I think, ranked number three uh, in Turkey in terms of R&D, and they got many awards on, on innovation and design. Just to give you the sense that, you know, it's, uh, the innovation has been recognized beyond the market, uh, the market success. And Ben, I pulled two quotes to share and close the courts of case and close today's show. One is a universal one for anyone interested in driving an innovating culture. And it goes as follows. Kortza instituted a program centered on innovation with top down initiatives designed to support the creation of breakthrough ideas on the front lines of the organization and the development and spread of those ideas with the help of mid level managers. And the second one is a closing quote from CEO at the time, Pekarun. He summarized the company's transformation this way. He said, it's fascinating to realize the upside you may have in a mature industry, once you get closer to your customers. I thought that absolutely nailed what he did. And then a couple of what you said about the reframing. Just a little story uh, to loop back to what we were talking about earlier. Uh, so Mehmet Pekarum is the one who started the whole initiative, took over, uh, Jenka Alpert took over. What is interesting, uh, he, 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 he joined in the CTO. This is when I, I, I met him and trained him in, in innovation. Then he became COO of Corsa. Then he became CEO of Corsa. Then uh, he became the CEO of the uh, industrials uh, group of companies within the holding company. And today... He's the CEO of the whole holding. And uh, listen to this. Even today, he's telling me he, as CEO of the whole holding, trains people in innovation. He actually dispenses the training sometimes himself. Wow. So when you talk about, you know, uh, getting the CEO and a senior level, level to talk, to walk the talk, I mean, he does. And he speaks the language. He trains people. He teaches people about it. So. You hear that, CEOs? <laughs> We're expecting CEOs up on the stage from now on. The challenges aren't hard enough, but that's what the future for you guys. Ben, it's it's always a massive pleasure, and I'm so happy we caught you on the year you were on sabbatical. And we're going to do a part four next week. Author of Built to Innovate, Essential Practices to Wire Innovation into Your Company's DNA, Ben Ben Sao. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Aidan. Always a pleasure. And don't forget, you can win a copy of Built to Innovate Ben Ben Sao's book. It's packed full of knowledge. And I want to finish today's show by thanking our sponsor, Zai. Zai is a global fintech innovating in their area of expertise, building integrated financial services for digital native and non native businesses. By supporting them, you're supporting us. If you're a business owner, if you're somebody that can support their business, please do check them out at hellozai.com.